personal knowledge, and then you must be willing to stand the consequences. Take both the roses and the bricks. The roses when it works, and the bricks when it doesn't. This is probably a good place to stop, see if, see if, you, if, if you have any questions, and then we'll come back and do a second half to talk about building the organization to make all of this truly happen. Let us now begin with the first question and answer session. And we will try to answer as many questions as possible, but please ask only one question per phone call, and please be brief as possible. Uh, you may call the studio directly at the phone numbers or fax which now appear on your screen. The first question comes to us via fax, and it's coming from Medellin, Colombia. And it says, to bring about organizational change in a company, it is necessary to first bring about a change in attitude and an attitude of change at the management level. What would be the most appropriate steps to take in order to bring about sensitivity of management in this area? I think the whole key is to create a sense of urgency. And you need to create that sense of urgency by confronting people with the facts and the realities of what's going on in the marketplace today. What do customers really want? What are competitors really doing? How do we stack up against other people in terms of our competitive benchmarks? Are we spending more per employee in overhead than other people are, for instance? We need to share that information widely so that everyone knows what our customers want, what our competitors are doing, and how we stack up against others competitively. Because it's out of that information, that granular knowledge, that comes a sense of urgency that creates the desire to change. That's the first step. Second question comes from the University of Panama, Technological University. Certain changes being made by organizations in the name of efficiency lead to subsequent layoffs. This type of change produces an environment of un insecurity, instability, and uncertainty. What steps do you think should be taken to manage this type of organizational change in such a way that we can keep our personnel motivated? I think this is almost the same kind of an answer. <laughs> because in reality, what we must do is to share the information about what's happening. You see, most change is driven from the top down. Most change is driven because a small group of people who have access to all of this competitive information, who know what's really going on, who see the organization failing, they say things have to be different. What we need to do is to share the information so that everyone can see how the organization is truly doing and then make that information as widely possible throughout the entire organization and with that information then encourage people to contribute to how do we get out of this mess. How do we, how do we reduce our costs? How do we truly grow our business? You know, there's a very interesting statement. The economists will tell you there is only one way to have a successful business. You can never, ever, ever cost cut your way to success. You absolutely, positively must grow your business. Imagine if you could have every single person in your organization not focused on how do we take these thousand pesos out of the business, but how do we put a thousand pesos more in the business by selling more, by growing our business. Creating the sense of urgency is the critical step that needs to be taken. Another question is coming from Brazil, from Professor Pedro Luis de Oliveira, who is from Brazil. Uh, hello, Brazil. The question is, what is the importance of quality as an inductor factor to important organizational changes? I think that quality is both a driver of change and a facilitator of change. In today's global marketplace, quality is an essential ingredient. It is the key to the door. It gets you into the playing arena. It doesn't score many points. It doesn't score any goals. But it gets you at least to get on the playing field. You must have quality. And when you don't have good quality, what happens is you don't even get in the, you, you can't even, even get in the arena. You can't even sign up to play. So quality drives the need to improve, the need to be different. It is one of those market factors that I talked about that everyone needs to see in order to know that they have to be different. But quality alone is not enough. 
It's important for me to point out that quality alone does not guarantee that you will win the game. Quality gets you into the game, but you need knowledge of the customer, granular knowledge of the customer to enable you to win that game. Quality is the key to the entrance. It is not the key to success. Next question is coming directly by phone from the Univer National Auto Autonomous University from Mexico. In, uh, from Mexico. How can a worker ta make his employer aware of a good a change that is good for his organization when the when the employer himself doesn't want those changes? Very good question. <laughs> That's a very good question. What I would urge is this. I think that each and every one of us that works in any organization has, has the responsibility, whether you are a production line worker or a middle level manager or the managing director, each and every one of us has the responsibility to shine the spotlight on the future towards which we must go. To really make this information about what's going on in the marketplace, how our customers are getting smarter and what they demand, how our competitors are getting better and what they require us to do, and the time changes that are happening so quickly, we need to bring that information forward. Any worker that has information, I would urge that what they do is that they get themselves, bring that information to the organization. Say an example. A manufacturing plant here in, right here in San Diego, have about 4,000 employees. They pay their employees two extra hours every week to go out and do competitive shopping. They go out and they shop the competitors' products. And for those two hours, what those 4,000 employees bring back to the organization is they put a one paragraph statement on the bulletin board for all 4,000 uh, individuals to read about what their competitors are doing and what the retailers that handle their products are saying about both the competitors' products and about their own products. It is a wonderful way to keep everyone involved in the process of planning for organizational change. It is absolutely the truth that if everyone is not involved in planning our future, no one will have one. Uh, now, uh, greetings to our participants from Tepic, from where we have the next phone call. Good morning, first of all. The question that we have is as follows. What other uh, systems can you add to organizational change to develop um, businesses? And in this day and age when we have so much, so many changes and when the businesses have to modify their sales procedures and also the personal attention. I think we need to come to the position and recognize that change is a permanent part of the environment. We need to continuously create success. It is not a one-time venture. We need to continuously change. It is not a one-time activity. I recall so clearly when I first began my change process and I talked to the person who was helping me as my guider and coach and I said, Alan, when can we get done with this so I can get back to my real job? And Alan looked at me and said, Jim, this is your real job. Change is the real job. So we need to live in an environment that says that we are going to be constantly changing. And that says we need to, we need to create an organization that's going to be able to do that. And I'm going to talk to those issues specifically in the coming in the coming module I think the first it begins with us understanding in the 15 centimeters right here that we need to continually change our customers demand it our competitors force it and the fast 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 pace of change insists upon it those things drive us to have to change it all the time that's just the way that's just the way the world is and we need to, and we can, meet that challenge. Okay, hello, hello. Empowerment should include in the objectives of the organizational systems the objectives of the people who work for the enterprise, for that business. 
I'm going to say uh, at the at the right start of the of the next module that the key to organizational success the driving force for organizational success is creating conditions under which employees feel successful creating the conditions for employee success a la empowerment is really the key to creating organizational success so you're absolutely correct the organization the objectives of the organization must be focused around how do we create success for employees and we'll talk in the very next section First part up, right up, right up after the uh, after the question and answer session, we'll talk precisely how to do that. Tenemos ahora una llamada telefónica que viene de Colima, Colima, del Instituto Tecnológico. Now this is another phone call from Mexico, Colima. Good morning. Our question is: Do you know in what to what extent organizational change and the present Culturization, culturization process of the with the alliances, with the different agreements. Will what's the relationship? How can we, how do we respect with all these changes and these adaptations? Uh, how can we keep respecting the local cultures? Uh, let me see if I understand the question. Uh, what I really hear you saying is that we have these these global. Uh, multinational alliances like NAFTA is an example uh, uh, and, uh, and GATT which which open the world up to much more freer trade and which drive much greater globalization how do we at the same time respect the need for local either national or regional kinds of tastes and interests if that's the question let me answer that if that isn't the question I urge you to call back again and you know and try again uh, I think that even though the world gets to be very global and and global in a sense that we really are talking about Bangkok, Thailand, as well as Mexico City, as well as Munich, Germany. Uh, I think that even though even though this is the case, is that every single organization I know of understands the need to customize down to the market of one. So what people in Mexico City buy is different than what people in Bangkok, Thailand are going to buy. And in fact, and in fact, what people in Tijuana buy is different than what the people in Mexico City buy. And in fact, what the people on one side of Mexico City buy is different than what the people on the other side of Mexico City buy. So that we really need to understand the need to customize down to the market of one. Campbell's Soup, as an example, sells tomato soup. Now you think tomato soup is tomato soup is tomato soup, right? They make 197 tastes of tomato soup because they recognize that there are different tastes that certain ethnic groups, that certain local cultures will will want a different kind of tomato soup. The same is true in products all across the world. As an example, Coca-Cola is one of the is probably the single most widely recognized brand in the world. And Coca-Cola makes over a thousand different tastes of Coca-Cola. Because each taste is different depending upon the local tastes in that particular organization, in that particular environment. Globalization of trade does not obviate the need for customization down to the market of one within local areas. Now we have another call coming from Costa Rica. They're calling from the Distance University. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. We would like to know Dr. Velasco's ideas about how you relate empowerment with re-engineering concepts, which is one of the other video conferences that we had. Empowerment and video and, and um, re-engineering. I think there needs to be an absolute linkage between the two. You cannot re-engineer from the top. The only way you can ever re-engineer and have it be successful is to is to re-engineer from the customer in number one is to really focus on how you can better serve that customer so to begin managing not from the organization out but from the customer in and then you absolutely positively in the re-engineering effort must involve the people who are doing the work to help to recraft re-engineer how that work is going to be done to better serve customers the purpose of re-engineering is to focus on the on value-added work for customers and must involve, in an empowering way, the people who do the work. Otherwise, re-engineering is bound to fail.
Now we welcome Tecate, Baja California. Tecate, hello. No, we dropped the call. Sorry. Next question is coming from the from Tuxtepec, Oaxaca. Do you think empowerment works in the culture of Mexico or other Latin American cultures in general? Absolutely, it does. Absolutely, it does. In fact, I think. The whole, the whole notion of entrepreneurialism, the whole notion of taking responsibility, I, you, you cannot travel anywhere in Latin or South America and not be impressed with how the people have coped with, how they are taking responsibility for dealing with their situations. I think the principle of empowerment absolutely works in these cultures which values people stepping forward, which values people coming to the fore, when you walk the streets of any city in Brazil, I am impressed with the entrepreneurialism, the empowerment, if you like, of the, of the, of the street vendors, of the people who are out there hustling, hustling to make the real in order to make it for themselves. Walk the streets in Mexico City and you'll see exactly the same thing. People out there making a business, making a living for themselves, looking to make the peso so they can live, so they can survive. I think the issues of empowerment fit right in with, fit right in with the cultures of Latin and South America. Our systems, our organizations have been too, have been too heavily bureaucratized. They have tended to stiltify and to slow this process down. I think we need to change those organizations, change the way we design those organizations, and those are the issues we're going to address in the next module. Because I think that we need to free the spirit. The spirit is there. The spirit is willing. We need to free that spirit by changing our organizations. And, and I know we can. A, now from the University of Cordoba, Argentina, Cordoba. Good morning. We would like to know how we must understand or respect the empowerment concept on, on a, an intermediate um, an intermediate level. What do we have to reach? Um, again, I'm having a little difficulty answering, uh, understanding the question. Let me see if I can. Uh, let me see if I can answer the question in two ways. And if it and if it isn't the, and if I have missed the question, please call back. Number one, you can think about intermediate levels in terms of intermediate levels in an organization. I think if you think about middle management, probably the hardest area to practice this, this philosophy of empowerment is in the middle management because, because the middle management tends to be in, <laughs> tends to be in the middle. And they tend to be squeezed by pressure from the bottom and by pressure from the top. I think how you practice empowerment in the middle, in the middle management areas, I think is that you practice empowerment by, and we'll talk about this in the next session as well, by establishing performance agreements with your customers, by really going out and talking with your internal customers, your employees as an example, your colleagues who work in other sections, and really figuring out what value-added work is for them, what you can do to help them succeed. I think that's the best way you in the middle can really practice empowerment. Empowerment also is a, is a process which requires ongoing development and it is easy to think about empowerment as it as a final stage but it needs to go through several different levels before you can get there I think you empower people in short steps you empower people when they have the skills when they have the knowledge when they have the capabilities and when you have designed an organization that truly brings the consequences along with that empowerment so people understand that they are responsible and accountable for those activities. I think that goes to making certain that people understand the level of skill and knowledge they have and what consequences they are re truly willing to step forward and be responsible for. Empowerment is an ongoing developmental process. The result is it doesn't happen instantly. It's a learning process. And so we have several intermediate stages and steps in that process. 
don't do, don't do too much too soon. Be certain. People have the skill. People have the knowledge to make good decisions, to, to, I mean, to really do what needs to be done, and that they are ready and willing to step forward and take the consequences of their actions, both the bouquets if it's right and the bricks if it's not. And now we get another phone call from Chihuahua from the Technological Institute in Chihuahua. Good morning. Our question is, what is the future of the multi-level marketing and how does that affect organizations? Interesting question. The future of multi-level marketing and how does it affect organizations? Uh, I mean, I think this, that, and let me answer the question in two ways. I think multi-level marketing, when you go through, when a manufacturer distributes through maybe one or even two distributors before it gets to a retailer. So you have several steps in the process. You may have agents and distributors in the middle between the manufacturer and the end user. When that happens, I think what we are seeing is a simplification of the supply chain. I think we're seeing that many of the middle steps, the agents and the distributors and so on, through the wonders of computerization, the end user, whether it's calling on a telephone, ordering from a catalog, or calling in response to something they see on a television set, calling directly to a manufacturer, I think that we are shortening the supply chain. We're taking days out of the supply chain by eliminating middle steps. I think that's one answer. I think a second answer is, is that multi-level marketing, as practiced by places like Amway as an example, I think is a, is a worldwide phenomenon. And it is a worldwide success. And the reason it's a success is because people or the manufacturer is able to reach directly into that market of one. Is able to really reach that individual consumer in his or her home and get that consumer what that consumer truly wants. In terms of making a customized, personalized set of products and services for that individual customer. In that sense, I think that multi-level marketing is to some extent a model of what's going to happen more and more frequently. As we eliminate people in the middle, the middle, uh, the middle person distributors, we, we go directly to, the, directly to the consumer and we can do that with increasing computerization. I think we'll see more organizations like an Amway where you have multi-level marketing. Greetings to our friends in Tijuana, our neighbors here. Good morning. Could you explain a little bit more, maybe with some examples, the concept that how can we really break old, old concepts of, 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 um, of um, costs? Very good question. I like the question very much. I think let's begin and say, and, and, and as an example, I, 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 I talk to my friends in the telcos uh, all the time, you know, uh, in the telephone organizations all the time, and, th and they have all this copper wire running, uh, running all over the world. Now, this copper wire, they spent a fortune in this copper wire, and the copper wire is on the ground, and they continue to amortize its cost, and they continue to have to pay for that cost, even though, even though Today, copper wire is not the most desirable wire to have in the world. You want to have fiber optic rather than co copper, as an example. The key element is, is, to, is to practice the mental exercise of asking yourself those four questions, of starting literally with a blank sheet of paper. It's going back and saying, as I look forward out three to five years, what is, what is, the, what is, the, is the industry in which I want to compete going to look like? Who are my competitors? What are, what are their strengths and weaknesses? What are their strategies going to be three to five years from now? And how do I create an organization so that, how, how to create my organization so that I create an unlevel playing field? Eliminating the warehouse is an example. Done exactly the same thing in manufacturing organizations, where you, by eliminating work in process, by, by tying in directly with both customers and their own primary suppliers, in several organizations, as an example of manufacturing, we've been able to go from turning inventories four to five times a year to turning inventories 25 to 30 times a year, just by tying in, making things more just in time. But 
even even beyond that, it's asking yourself, what are those customers going to be like that I want to have three to five years from now? And what are they really going to want to buy that I can do better than any of my competitors? It is the key of starting with a blank sheet of paper, of not being encumbered by the way things are. It is easier to create tomorrow than change yesterday. And we will never, ever, ever be able to get to tomorrow unless we learn how to create it. Thank you, Dr. Velasco. Your answers are very interesting. Now we're going to go, with, uh, go on with Module 2, where Dr. Velasco will speak about the foundations of building a, the 21st century organization. Those were some really interesting questions. You'll have some more opportunity after the end of this next module. Let's talk now about how we build an organization that does what we think needs to be done to build this customer-focused, knowledge-based, accountability-driven organization. We're going to build a little Parthenon here, similar to the one that exists today in Athens, Greece. There are four parts to this Parthenon. We begin by looking at the value equation. The value equation very simply says that if you really want to have a successful organization, the only underline the word only, way to get that, is to create the conditions under which employees feel successful. Because when employees feel successful, they help create success for customers, and that when you create success for customers, that's when you get organization success and shareholder success, and that's what generates the money necessary to continue to reinvest in the business. Now, what are the things that create employee success? Well, employee success basically is a function of employee productivity. People who feel more productive feel more successful. And when they feel more productive and more successful, they also are more satisfied and experience more growth. So the key is productivity. But what is productivity? Productivity is not working harder. It is not making more pieces. Productivity fundamentally is line of sight to customers. Productivity is basically knowing what customers want and knowing when you deliver it. So the first key principle, value, the first key principle of building this new 21st century organization is to build an organization where each and every individual has line of sight to customers and understands what their customers want, 